So thank you for letting me have the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, I'll just give a little bit of a summary while, of a little bit while the lights are being taken care of. Um, the presentation itself will probably take about 30 minutes, and I, that might be kind of long in some respects, but the, the report itself is about 87 pages, and I felt to give it justice, I had to give a uh, comprehensive overview of what, what occurred. Oh, thank you, that's perfect. So with no further ado, I'm going to start this, and if, and if I can ask the board to wait to the end of the presentation for questions, um, just because I may actually cover a lot of it during the discussion. So really quickly, I represent statistical forecasting. Um, we've been providing demographic services for school districts in the state for the last 20 years. Um, more than 100 school districts in New York and New Jersey have been represented um, by us. And since 2006, we're the consultant to the New York City Public Schools. They're the largest school district in the nation. We do all their demographic enrollment forecasting, as well as looking at a myriad of other issues. Um, my background, I'm the executive director. I have a doctorate from Rutgers in educational statistics and measurement from the Graduate School of Ed, also about 20 years ago. Um, I publish. I still publish in this field, uh, just submitted a paper to a journal that's been accepted last month, and it testified in court in expert witness hearings um, where in schools actually want divorces from each other, and you may not even know that exists, but in some situations where school districts are sending their high school students, for instance, to another town on a tuition basis, you just can't get up and walk out. You have to go through an ALJ hearing to see if there's any negative racial, educational, or financial impacts, and I get um, expert witness testimony in some of those cases. So let's talk about this study. Is this mic on? I feel like I've lost the mic, and it is on? Okay. So the study was actually completed in May of uh, five months ago. So um, a lot of the data that you're going to see represents the last school year, which is the 2017 18 school year. Um, the last time I've, I actually have done work for your district as far back as 2003. I cannot remember who the superintendent was back then. That was 15 years ago. But I have worked for your district. So the main crux of any dem demographic report, most people will say, is that you're projecting enrollments. And that is the case in this for a five year period. And many people say, well, why don't you go out to 10 or 15 or 20? The problem is, as you get further and further out, you're starting to really estimate things that are very hard to estimate, such as births. It's really hard to capture um, that one particular variable, which will be your kindergarten kids. We do do it for New York City, but because they're so much larger, statistically, sample size, I can get away with that. I cannot do it for communities as small as this. Other things that were looked at were the district's historical enrollments, birth trends, fertility rates, community population trends in each community on the age structure, which is really important. We'll talk about that. New housing and how that may impact the projections. We're also going to show you some maps showing where students have lived in the 2012 year as, as opposed to the 2017 school year. And then we're going to do another, a completely different analysis called a housing turnover analysis. It's using the housing turnover rates of homes in each community to project future enrollments. And it's a completely independent analysis, and we'll, we'll discuss that briefly at the end. So here are the two communities, the borough and the township. I'll just refer to them as that. You can see that the, uh, the, the township, which is the lower one on the far, the far left there, actually passed the borough's um, population around 1980 and is now, I think, about three, two, two or 3,000 <coughs> more people than the borough. Um, so what you're looking at from the left-hand side of the screen of that vertical line is the census data from 1940 to 2010. Everything to the right-hand side is um, future populations projected up through 2040, not through myself, but other agencies, specifically something called the North Jersey Transportation Planning Authority. So they're really projecting a slight growth in the township and the barrel to be almost flat. So as part of my study on both of the communities, I always like to know who I'm dealing with. Um, 
getting more descriptive statistics on race, economics, housing, things like that. This is really interesting. I, I do a lot of these studies, hundreds um, of different kinds of studies, and this is probably one of the wealthiest, most educated communities I've come across. There's maybe one or two in the Bergen County area that are around the same amount where you are, but you're up there. Both communities are primarily white, 91% white in 2010. The median age, you can see up there, 38 in, in the borough, 43 in the township, slightly higher in the township than the state. The foreign-born population is not that much, which is not surprising because you're, you're predominantly white. 16% um, in the borough, 15% in the township. China and the United Kingdom are the largest sources of foreign-born population. Now, here's where the education comes into play. 76% have a bachelor's degree or higher in the borough, 75% in the township. Those numbers are off the charts. I think uh, one community I've worked with is about 80. That's about as high as I've seen, though. Both communities have incomes over $200,000, where the state is 91, more than double the median family income in the state. Uh, there's some statistics on the number of housing units. There's more housing in the township. Most of the type of housing here are single family, either most of them are detached. Um, you can see also there's not too much of a renter occupied housing, about 21% in the borough, 18% in the township. And take a look at the median value of an owner-occupied unit, 729,000 in the borough, 827,000 in the township. Again, at, at, uh, these are astronomical numbers for what I see normally. Um, let's move on from there. And so here's, here's a picture of both communities. You can see the borough and the township, three schools. They're really hard to see because you might be far away, but what you're looking at is a, a six schools shown in the diagram, and now we're going to see them a little different. These are the elementary attendance zones for the three K to threes. Um, you can see that the Washington Avenue is split be on one on two different areas, um, and if you're wondering why there's nothing right there, that's the Great Swamp. Okay, so there's no attendance area boundaries in this one region of the township, but you can see the three different zones. So talking now about the school district, your enrollment as of October 15th, 2017, exactly one year ago to the day, that's the, this is the census day. In fact, your, your district probably is going to use whatever today's enrollment is will be their 1819 enrollment for the year. So we captured that, date, that data on October 15th every year, and it was about 41.75 last October. In the last six years, however, it's been fairly stable. Only about 100 students swing in the last six years, which is very little. We use something called the cohort survivor ratio method. I'll talk about that a little bit later on, how to project what is used to project enrollments. It's a method that is sanctioned by the DOE, and it's been around for a very, very long time. But the, the stable enrollment is kind of tricky because you really need to pull back some layers to see some things. I'll get to that in a moment. But here's the overall enrollment for the last 10 years. You can see quite clearly that enrollment was going up here. And then it's kind of flattened out for the last six years. But what really gets interesting is we start looking at the enrollment by level. PK to 3, 4 to 5, 6 to 8, 9, 12. And the one I like to point out is the PK to 3, which is the top one. You can see that it peaked right here. I think that's around 2011 or so. At Oh, actually right here. Sorry, 13, 18 in the 2009 year. Since then, it's, if you follow the little pointer, it's been declining a little bit. That's about 150 student drop in the last uh, eight or nine years. Now, the reason why I point that out if you follow my logic, we refer to this slide as the window to the future. If elementary enrollment is declining, you can imagine that the upper grades, 4 to 5, 6 to 8, 9 to 12, at some point, those lower counts are going to progress upward to those grades and will cause declines in them as well. But for the current pictures, you can see the high school. Look at the high school enrollment. It's been going up. Why? Because at some point, the elementary enrollment and the middle school enrollment was very robust and going up and has caused that enrollment to go up as well as the middle school which is the one right here in the middle 
However, that will change. So we use something called the cohort survivor ratio method. Really simple. What we're looking at is the progression of students from one grade to the next over time, historically, and assuming that those progression rates are going to continue into the future. So I have an example up there, really easy to follow. If I have 100 first graders in the 16-17 year, and they become 95 second graders the next year, the survival ratio, or no one's dying, or we like to call sometimes the progression ratio, is 95 over 100, or 0.995. If you see values below one, you're losing some students, and if it's above one, you're gaining some students. So we compute these survival ratios for all grades, birth to kindergarten included, K to one, one to two, all the way up to 11 to 12, and we do it for a 10-year historical period. And what I noticed was that of the 13 possible at ratios, um, what we do is always take an average of the last four or five or six, because there could be some outlier ratios and what we noticed that seven of the 13 were above one, and that most of those were down at the K to five level, indicating that you're having inward migration of students in this school district at the elementary level. Why? Very easy. Excellent school districts bring people in, particularly with students with um, elementary age kids. So by computing an average ratio for all the grade levels, we then use those averages against the most recent enrollment in the 17-18 year to project future enrollments, assuming that those ratios are going to continue to the future. That's the main idea. You also have a phenomenon in this district called positive first grade replacement, which has occurred in seven of the last nine years. However, it has been decreasing in magnitude over time. What is it? Well, it's when the number of 12th grade graduating students is less than the number of first grade students replacing them in the next year. Normally, we compute that difference between the 12th grade population and the kindergarten population. But because you have a half day K a half day program for kindergarten, it's more appropriate to compare to first grade because you gain so many students from kindergarten to first grade. It's a better, better indicator. So last year, you lost 47 students due to this phenomenon. But take a look at what happens. When you were gaining students about 10 years ago, you had a pretty nice size positive first grade replacement. In time, in the last five years, it's getting closer and closer to a minimal gain. And in the most recent year, you actually had a loss. Um, I'm going to show this same graph next to your total enrollment change over time, okay, which is the blue values. And you can see what a strong correlation there is between the overall enrollment change in the district and the first grade replacement. So if I go over to here, um, just the first year, way, way back, you gained roughly 180 students in the district, but 154 was just due to this phenomena of first grade replacement. So this first grade replacement magnitude really has a strong impact on what your enrollment change is going to be in the district just simply by looking at the outgoing graduating seniors versus the first grade incoming first graders. Birth counts. Uh, they're used to project kindergarten students five years later. It's been fairly stable in the last couple years after a long period of decline. Take a look. You had 323 births combined for the two communities in 2003, only 156 in 2016. That's the most recent data we have. So basically your birth count has been cut in half. That just spells to me immediately that you're going to have a loss in your kindergarten count. Well, you have. In 2008, you were 304. This past year, 201. It's not exactly a 50% cut, and that's because you're gaining so many people who are bringing kids into the communities under the age of five, but it's still not enough to overcome the declining birth rate. The fertility rates here are low. Uh, women are not having babies as much as other parts of the state or the county, as you can see from that last line up there. Okay, this is going to be a little challenging maybe to see. I'm not sure how your vision is, but what you're going to see on the left-hand side are the births for each one, each of the communities, the borough and the township. This is the aggregate. So if you just follow this straight across, this tells you how many kindergarten students you had five years later. 
So you had 323 births. Five years later, 304 kindergarten students. And this is the birth to kindergarten survival ratio, which is just simply this column, 304 divided by 323. For most districts that have a half-day program, we typically see values less than one because parents send their children to either a parochial or private full-day kindergarten programs for the first year before they enroll them here. However, in the last four years, even with having a half-day program, you're well above one, which is telling me that you definitely have, in the last four years, a lot of people moving into this community to educate their kids here. Um, I also looked at births compared to first grade students six years later. It's, again, on a big jump up in the red here um, from where it was just 1.1, really, and now it's around 1.4, 1.5. So, and we'll talk about home sales a little bit later in the report. But there are your births. The top one, the top one is the aggregate of the two communities, and you can see how it has been going and trending down. So to compute enrollments by elementary school, I tried to get births from the State Department of Health at a lower level of ge geography than just the borough or the township. So what they gave it to me by is something called a census block, which is a really, really small geographical area that makes up your borough and township. You could have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of blocks within the borough. And after I did some work with the data, I was able to determine, overlaying it across the um, elementary attendance boundaries, these are the number of births that you've had by attendance zone for Milton Avenue, Southern Boulevard, and Washington Avenue. And the state did not have exactly block locations for some, so they were unknown. They know they were born in the borough of the township, but couldn't tell me exactly where. But what's interesting here is Washington Avenue has had the most number of births over this time period. But if you compare the 2003 births versus the 2016 births, all of them have really dropped. The biggest drop was in Southern Boulevard. I think it's minus 68 if my vision is halfway decent down there from, from 03 to 16. That is a big, big decline. So to show you how big of a drop off, I'm going to show you the births in 2003 for the attendance areas, and I'm going to use the same scale. So reds and oranges are the highest values on the scale. So this is in 03, there's in 16. Blues and purples, we're getting to that cold zone where you don't have as many births. So everyone has really gone down across the zones. But because you have only three zones, it doesn't tell me much. So let's actually look at it at the block level. Dark blue would be where the greatest number of births are in the borough and the township. You can see where they are in the southern part right here. Watch what happens 13, year, 13 years later. You're just really, really losing um, number of births. And it's really not any particular area. It's across the board. So why? Well, part of it's because of who you are as a community. Um, this is what's called an age pyramid. And you have females on one side in green and males stacked on the other side in orange. And they're in five-year increments. So you're seeing the number of people from 40 to 44, 45 to 49, so on and so forth. But what's interesting, this is in 2000 for the borough. The greatest number of people you have is in this area right here, 35 to 39. But look how little you have in the 20s. And watch what happens 10 years later. It gets older, as you would expect. The, 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 big, ver the big lines move north, upwards, which makes sense if people stay here. But you still have a big gaping hole down here in the center. So when I compared the data over 10 year period, again, this is a little hard to see, but in red are the biggest losers between 2000 and 2010, and the biggest gainers were in blue. So the 30 to 34 range here was the biggest loss of people in that 10 year period. And of course, if you know anything about biology, that's when women are having a lot of their kids. So if there's less women, guess what? less kids. And it's not just that group. Look at the 25 to 29 group right above them and even the 35 to 39 right below them. Where we're gaining? Down in the 40s, 50s, 60s, so on and so forth. The big gainers 
was actually the five to nine group, which if you advance that eight years from 2010 to now we're in 2018, that would be roughly your middle and high school bunch right now. So that's, that's still showing that increasing population that I showed earlier in the, uh, tonight. This is the township, doesn't look much different. 10 years later, you can see this is what it gets like definitely older. Saint, this is the state of New Jersey, just to show you what it's supposed to look like. Um, when you have a more heterogeneous population, more heterogeneous in terms of race and socioeconomics, this is what you get. You get more people in the 20s and 30s all the way across the board. You do not have you have uh, heterogeneity in either community here. It's more homogeneous. So for the township, you can see again in red the biggest losers in terms from one year from the one decade to the next is that 30 to 34 population, and that is my reasoning for why your birth counts have declined so much. Not only the low fertility rates but you just don't have enough people to generate births um, from that time period. Now, we're almost next to the next census. 2020 is just two years away, not about a year and a half. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. We do not have better data, unfortunately. Um, I called both communities in terms of their planning departments about new housing. One of the key elements of any demographic study is how much new housing is going to happen and how will that impact the projections. Now, this is a list of Chatham boroughs. I'm not going to go into any great detail. The biggest one is a potential um, project which has not been approved. It's the post office plaza redevelopment. It would be around 100 apartment units near the train station. Probably not going to have that many people in, with kids. If it's near a train station, they typically do not draw very high in terms of families. This is the township. Um, the skate park, again, was one. The redevelopment is one where there could be some affordables there. That one has not been approved. There was not um, bedroom distributions available for that or Dixiedale Farm, which had not been approved when I was talking about it back in the spring. I don't know if it has been to date. So one of my jobs then is if we have new housing, how many kids can we estimate out of those new housing units? And we get some material from Rutgers University that tells us how many kids come out of detached single family homes, apartments, townhouses, based upon the bedroom distribution. So using that data, which was a little older because it was from the 2000 census, I made a rough estimate of how many kids could come out. And I say rough because many of the bedroom distributions, which I need to make co these computations, were unavailable. So I had to make some assumptions, give or take. If everything holds according to what the state would say, it would be roughly 50 new kids from these new housing developments, which is not an earth-shattering number. When you look at the statistics, the greatest number of children always come out of detached single-family homes. And since all the housing stock that is planned is either apartment um, or I think maybe in some condos or something like that, multifamily type units do not have that type of yield. So here are the student yields by development, according to my estimations. I did not add them into the baseline enrollment projections because I did not have the bedroom distribution. I wasn't sure if some of them were even going to get approved, so I don't want to float the numbers higher unless they're actually going to get built. And I wasn't really sure of the construction timeline occupation. This is something the board will need to consider um, going forward, keeping an eye on these projects to see where, if they even come to um, fruition. So remember I talked about home sales in the beginning? Take a look here. Chatham Borough was pretty consistent up to about 2008. You see this big drop off right here? That was the mortgage crisis and banking crisis of 2008. A big, big drop in the number of sales and it did last for quite some time. Take a look here. It has started to increase, particularly in the last four years. And I keep harping earlier in the report that the birth to kindergarten survival ratios have gone up because people who buy homes in these communities are not older people looking to retire here. These are families with children that want to get their, their kids into the school district. So when you see greater number of sales, that's going to translate, in my opinion, to more students in the district. Here's the township, a similar type of pattern where in 2008 it dropped off, but it seems like the uh, recovery happened pretty fast here compared to the borough. 
So what are the projections? Well, let's go back to what I first said was the current enrollment as of the 17-18 year. It was around 4,175 students. So you can see I'm projecting a very slow decline over the next five years, upwards around 228 students. Okay, that's probably a roughly about a 5% decline. If we look at it by grade configuration, it's not uniform. I'm actually still expecting the high school to continue growing, pushing those bigger cohorts through the system from middle school up in the high school. And you can see that at the PK to three, four to five, and six to eight levels, I am projecting um, declining enrollment. The middle school actually is projected to be fairly stable for the next three years before those smaller cohorts actually come on up causing this decline. So it's not going to happen right away. This is an interesting slide. Um, this is the capacity analysis table. So it has each school, what the building capacity is. And I'm going to say this very um, succinctly, that the capacity is not a fixed number. It is a value based upon board district teacher-student ratios that can be changed and modified very easily. Um, so I want to make sure you understand that a capacity value is not a fixed number like a fire code. Um, if the board wants to have 25 students in a classroom versus 22, the capacity can very easily be, be increased. But these are the capacity values based upon how you're currently using the buildings. Some of these values may be actually a little low because there was some work done over the summer uh, in the middle school. And I believe, was it, which one? In Milton. So... Any value that you see, so now we're going to compare the capacity to the enrollment in 1718. If you see a blue value, it means you have extra seats. And red means that we have a shortage of seats. We call them unhoused students. It means that no one's getting left out in the cold in the hallways or anything like that. All it means is that according to board policy, the building is, is not have enough seats for what you want to use it for. So the last column shows the projected enrollment compared to the capacity and you can see that Milton Avenue is expected due to declining enrollment have a greater surplus but all the other buildings either have a small shortage of seats or just a very small surplus of seats so it's tight all the way through and through either currently except for Milton Avenue or um, going out into the future. All right, so now you're going to see some maps. Uh, as I mentioned before, I took the student address database from the 12-13 year and the 17-18 year and brought them into a mapping software to show where students live by census block. And then um, since different census blocks are different sizes, I divided the census block by the uh, area of the census block in square miles so that we can compare one census block to another, apples to apples. That's called the student density. And a student yield is how many students live in a housing unit. So we're going to show you places in the communities where more students live in a house than others. So here's the 1213 census block um, counts. And I'm going to show you it to 1718. Again, I always use the same scale so you can see. And it really hasn't changed that much because in the last five years, as you remember, enrollment has been fairly stable. So there's a little bit of change, but nothing drastic. Then we go to the densities. The, the biggest densities are in red and yellow and orange, and they are in the center right here. You can barely see them. They are going to disappear, but you can see in general, uh, blue is the, uh, the smallest density. And uh, that's not true. I should say that the, um, the smallest density is the one that's not colored at all, like in this region out here. So you can see over time, nothing much has really changed. This is the number of students per housing unit. The reds and the yellows and orange would be the greatest number of kids per housing unit. And again, that has not changed much at all either. Now, the last piece of this presentation, let's take just a few more minutes, is projecting enrollments using housing turnover. And this is a completely independent analysis, has nothing to do with cohort survivor ratios. It's not used in, to be um, for planning for new schools or additions or anything like that. It's more or less to give the board an idea what would happen if you had a lot of homes sell from senior citizens to families with young children. How would that affect the school district? It's more or less modeling if you want to look at it that way. There are three inputs. 
One, our housing turnover rates by length of ownership. I'll talk about that in a moment. The current distribution of homes by length of ownership and student yields by length of ownership. I cannot take credit for this. This is from my colleagues from Cal Berkeley who came up with this model. So turnover rates are simply how many homes sell in a particular year out of the total number of homes that are in that one particular cohort. So what I was able to do was from the state of New Jersey is get every single home in the borough and the township that's at least a one to four family. We remove apartments, farms, anything like that. And we're gonna track each individual home through its life cycle to see when it's sold. And we only use valid sales. If you just give a dollar sale to your, your, your husband or your wife to get it out of your name, that doesn't count. Um, so unfortunately, sales data was only available for roughly the last 25 years, 1993 to 2017. Some communities I work with, it goes back to 1973. I don't know why the state did not have earlier data. And we're gonna follow each cohort of homes beginning in 19, 1993 to see when they sell. So I give you an example so you can understand what the heck is going on here. So say I have a home built in 1985. It sold in 95, 98, and 2006. It's actually part of three cohorts. Um, we can't say that the first length of ownership is from 85 to 95 because I don't have any sale data prior to 93. It could have sold in 89, I don't know. But we can say that that one, that one home sold from 1995 to 98, which is a three year period, three year length of ownership. 1998 to 2006 was an eight year ownership. And now, since I only had data through 2017, that home is 11 years, not old, but held for 11 years by the owner. So you can understand how this process works. So what we actually do is compute how many homes sell at each length of ownership from zero to 24, 25 years out. And this is showing you for Chatham Borough, the greatest number of homes, the highest percentage, the highest turnover rate happens in the fourth year of ownership where around 7% of the homes that are owned four years would sell. Way down here, once you get out in the 20s, roughly only 1% of the homes sell in a year. Is this unusual? No. What I usually see is that turnover rates are very high, usually around between four and 10 years of ownership, and then they s completely just drop off the table. Now there's a lot of homes I'm not showing way out here that have never sold. I just don't have data on them because I only had data from 93. So I could have a home that was built in 1992, never been sold. It's sitting out there, but we have no turnover rates of homes beyond 24 or 25 years. So that's for the borough. This is how many homes currently exist in the borough by length of ownership. So again, the greatest number of homes are typically in the beginning because once they're sold, they go down to zero years of ownership. Down here in the, on the x-axis, this is showing years of ownership from zero out to about 24. So most of the homes in the borough are really new in terms of ownership. And that's not uncommon. We were a much more mobile society than my parents who were in the same home for 56 years or whatever it was. You know, it's not, there's always people moving up and getting new jobs across the country. It's a very different society. So you don't have a lot of homes owned for 20, 40, 30 years way down here. So the beautiful thing with the data that I was able to get, I was able to take the property database from the borough and join it to the school district's database to figure out how many kids lived in homes at various lengths of ownership. And what we find out for the borough is that most of the, the, the highest number of students are typically you know, in the four to about 14 years of ownership, roughly around 1.2 kids per home. As soon as when it gets around 14 years, it just drops off the table. Why? Well, the kids have graduated and there's no one left in the house. If people stay and still own that home, there's no more kids. So the yields per home for long lengths of ownership are very, very low. And that is also very common. And you'll see now for the township, again, their highest turnover rates were at two years of ownership where 8% of the homes would sell as opposed to way down here at 24 years, you're getting about 1% of the homes selling. 
And this is by looking at 25 years worth of data. It's a very, very complex, convoluted process. Your eyes are bleary after looking at all this data, but this is, the, this is what the output is. So here's the township's number of homes by length of ownership. Again, most of the homes that are owned currently are down here in the lower lengths of ownership. But the yields are high again for the township until we progress in time. So what we're gonna be then doing to compute number of students is we use the current length of home, home ownership in each community and the historical turnover rates to either advance the homes to one more year of ownership or sell it and have it return to zero years of ownership. So in other words, if you go back to this table right here for Chatham Township, for instance, I am gonna use historical turnover rates at each length of ownership to either advance one of those homes one more year of ownership, or if it sells, it goes back down to zero. And I have to do that for the borough and for the township, and I'm using your historical turnover rates for each year of ownership. Now that takes into consideration good years of selling and bad years of selling. Um, you know the markets for real estate do change over time. And then what I do is I do that for a five-year period. So I'm advancing homes rather than students into the future. I'm advancing homes. I'm multiplying the number of homes at each length of ownership by the number of students that we expect at each length of ownership. So what this gets you as an end product is the number of students that we can expect um, at each length of ownership. And then we have to add it up for the borough, add it up for the township. And I did some manipulation of data. I did use your average turnover rates from the last 15 years uh, from zero to 15. However, I did some simulations for the upper distribution. Um, I said that the turnover rates in the borough would be 8% in one situation for the upper uh, long held homes and six and a half for the township to increase the selling process to simulate what would happen if you had seen selling rates for older homes or longer, long, longer held homes that you've never seen before. What would happen? And the answer is that third bullet. Your enrollment would slowly go up to about 4,500 students. So you would go from where you are now, about 4,175, so about a gain of 300 students. Um, but the big caveat, that's not likely to happen you're not likely to get turnover rates that high. You have never seen turnover rates that historical. That would be like all the senior citizens selling their homes all, all at once. And I just have never seen that happen. I've been doing this for many, many years. People say, oh, I know it's gonna happen. It has to happen. It just does not happen instantaneously. It happens gradually over time. So for enrollment to increase due to housing turnover, you would need turnover rates never experienced historically. So to make this a long story short, I don't see housing turnover driving your enrollment going forward in the future. Other factors such as new housing or home sales might do something like that at, to some extent, but uh, not to this extent. So as a summary, this ends the, the uh, presentation. Enrollments are projected to be lower at the end of the five-year projection period, particularly at the PK to five level. Declining birth, rate, birth rates have led to um, fewer kindergarten kids. The smaller elementary cohorts will eventually rise through the system, leading to declines in the middle school, which I've projected for this five-year period. The high school, I'm still projecting an increase. So when I'm talking about high school and long-term, I'm talking beyond the five-year projection period. It could be as many as 10 years out before you start to see a decline there. The increase in the home sales has led to inward migration of families with children under the age of five. However, it's not enough to overcome the prevailing older age structure where you don't have as many um, women in certain areas having births. So there's two, two opposing forces here, and the one that's winning out is the age structure of the communities. So with that, I will turn it back over to the board for questions. I hope that was about a half an hour. It's probably a little longer than that. Thank you. Sure. We'll be back in the light now. 
There we go. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Grip. That was quite a lot of information. <laughs> yes, I hope it wasn't too much. No, no, no. <laughs> it was good, and I appreciate you kind of breaking down. I'm sure the mathematics was far more complex, and I, I appreciate you breaking it down into layman's terms. Um, if you don't mind just entertaining a few questions. Of course. And just for um, process, I'm going to maybe start with a couple questions and give my colleagues a moment to catch their breath, and then I'll start with Mr. Ryan on the end, and then go over to Mary on my left, and we'll toggle back and forth like that to see who has questions. But again, just to give them a moment, I'll, I'll start it off. Um, quick question on uh, two, two items that I, I had trouble with, not for any scientific reason, just from having lived here for 30 years. You had mentioned that um, there's not a lot of families or activity near transportation hubs or you know, mass transit, or maybe I read it in the report and you sort of alluded to it. And I, 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 it goes against kind of what I see here for the last 30 years. People move in to get to the city in 41 minutes. So I, I'm not sure how to reconcile that with your tremendous amount of scientific data <laughs> versus why people, you know, move here. The school districts, great town, but a lot of it is also transportation mm -hmm. to where we all work. You mind if I answer that one first before we move to any other questions? Certainly. Um, so maybe, maybe, maybe some of my comments were misconstrued. I didn't talk anything about activities, uh, you know, lack of activities. The one development that I had discussed was the post office development, which is near the train station. So developments that are located near mass transit are called TODs. They're called transit-oriented developments. Mm -hmm. Uh, historically, the yields out of those types of complexes range from about 0 0.02 kids per unit to about 0 .8, 0.08 kids per unit. So it's not a reflection anything of your community. It's just saying that when you have something walking distance to a train station, a couple of blocks around the perimeter of the train station, the people that are buying those are typically not people with families. And th in this case, they're multifamily units, so I would highly doubt that they're going to be um, families with kids moving into those types of units, one and two bedroom units. Right. It, it, um, that'll be interesting. And you also said that multifamily um, housing traditionally doesn't yield as many students, although currently, and if you look at our enrollment, we yield just under 100 students from, and, and I apologize, on the school board, we don't really distinguish between township and borough. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just one school district. Mm -hmm. So between our multifamily housing, either on Main Street, or maybe on our River Road, it's currently yielding close to 100, maybe just under, you know, high 80s, 90s kids. So is this not typical just because it doesn't match the data, or is that? Well, I don't know how many multifamily units you're talking about. So if you have 100 students out of 300 houses, that would be right on okay. par for what I'm expecting. So let me, I'll throw some more numbers your way. Excellent. A multifamily townhouse, or a two-bedroom apartment would probably yield around 0.3 children per unit. Okay. Uh, a detached single-family home could yield anywhere between 0.8 to one child okay. per unit, almost triple. Right. So, uh, you know, I can't answer whether I, it's atypical for your community uh, without knowing the number of multifamily units you're talking about. Right, understood. And then if I could just throw one more thing out mm -hmm. there. Tremendous amount of work went into this. Really appreciate it. I know it only goes out accurately for five years. As we learn more information about the developments at, at the various township and boroughs and as they unfold and specifically bedroom information, are you able to apply that to the data here? Let's say we get more information two years from now. Mm -hmm. Are you then able to kind of infuse that into the study you've already done and maybe go out two more years with some if you have more accurate bedroom information? Yes, yeah, so at that point it would be a complete update because not only you would have two years worth more of enrollment here, uh -huh. you would have two years more worth of birth data so we could add on to what's already been established. This okay. is the base foundation. We can continue Keep. to update as in time as needed. Okay, ooh, last call. Okay, very good. <laughs> okay, great. Guess. Thank you, Dr. Grip. I know. Stop playing with the lights, Mike. It's actually the superintendent, I believe. Yes, it is. Turning the lights off. And huh? the, Jim O'Neill was the previous superintendent that you had. Um, I thought so, but that was uh, so many years ago. I wasn't sure if he was back if he had back then. Was anybody on the board than 15 years ago? I was on the board when uh, Mr. O'Neill was on the board, but not 15 years ago. Okay. But, um, but that was the name you were trying to come up with. Yes. He's over in Livingston, I believe, now. Um, so, Mr. Ryan, if I'll start with you. And then, Mary, I'll jump over to you and zigzag again. Uh, thank you. That was that was uh, very interesting. Uh, the the presentation went a lot better than reading the re report. 
right? It was much, much clearer presented than, than reading it. So <laughs> thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, based on, on the data that was available to you and, and what you've done here, what percentage of accuracy would you give this report? And, and what do you wish, what other data elements do you wish you had to make it more precise? Well, I think I'm going to take the, I'll take the first question first. So as a demographer, we have an industry standard that we shoot for as a benchmark. Yep. And that benchmark is 1% error rate per year. So if you're looking out five years, that would mean if we're off by 5%, that would still be within the threshold uh, that we're looking for. So, you know, 1% for your district, is, we're only talking about, um, you know, like 40 kids, which isn't that much. So that's, that's the numbers I shoot for. It's definitely harder when you get to the smaller districts, but I think that's within reason. Um, as far as data that I would love to see, I can say that I say this for every district, there's so much uncertainty between BERTs and then who shows up on your doorstep as kindergarten students or first grade students five years, six years later. Um, what I would love to see is if we had better data by single year age one-year-olds, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds. The census data does have that only every 10 years. So it's two years from now. Yes. you would be able to. And okay. we'll have that. Um, there is a data set I used in here. It's, it's from the census. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. It's called the American Community Survey. They take data from a five-year period from 2012 to 16, for instance, and take sample. So it's only a five, it's a 1% sample per year. So they take a 5% sample of those students of those ages. I wouldn't hang my hat on any of that stuff, not on a 5% sample. So we're waiting for that better census data. But other than a house to house census where you can actually get everyone's age, that's, that would be my dream and wish. But um, I don't see myself knocking on doorbells or, or knocking on doors. But, um, you know, that would be the, the best data we could possibly get. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Mary? I could just talk. You can hear me now? Okay. One of the things that struck me in your presentation was um, our capacity. And um, you said that's not a fixed number, mm -hmm. which um, I didn't realize that. And um, I know that we have been talking about redistricting and uh, with the, the possibility of it <laughs> and um, if ha, could you just kind of go over the factors that could change capacity sure so now this is an architectural question but since I work with architects I'll give you what I know okay. okay so there's two different methodologies of computing capacity one is called FES it stands for C facilities efficiency standards and that is basically saying I know the square footage in a building each student gets 125 square feet. I can then divide one into the other. That tells you how many students that should be in that building. So it's based on square footage allowances. The second methodology is called district practices methodology. This is based upon the board and their intended um, student teacher ratios for elementary, middle, and high school. So if I know that I have 20 classrooms in an elementary building, of which my board policy says I am only going to educate 22 kids. I can then multiply 20 times 22. I get 440. There's my building capacity. If the board wants to change that student-teacher ratio up or down, you can easily change the capacities. Then special ed is another issue because they do not have the same amount of um, student-teacher ratios as a regular ed classroom. So the more special ed classrooms you have in a building will reduce the amount of your building capacity. So it's a real tricky thing. Um, and if you have a lot of special ed students in one particular year, it can really change things. I hope that helps. I, I appreciate that. Sure. Thank you. In your analysis? For the, uh, the projections? Yes. Yeah, they're, they're located. So if they're self-contained, um, so let me go take a step back. The enrollment data that I got is from the Department of Ed. The Department of Ed does not, um, we have students who maybe get pulled out, maybe for special ed for maybe a period or so. They're still counted with the regular ed population. The true special ed according to state is what we call ungraded. 
and that population was taken into account as well. So uh, I did have them separated according to that type of definition. Ungraded would be the self-contained class. Yes, right. Okay. Mary, did you have anything else for now? Yeah, You're good for now. No, no, no worries. Um, Ann, do you have any? I don't know. Mary stole my question. Oh. <laughs> so thanks for answering it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Mike? I guess uh, my question would be, uh, as someone who, excuse, as someone who um, did this study, what, what would you uh, like to leave us with the most? What should we as people planning for the future, or board planning for the future in conjunction with the town, be uh, concerned at with? If anything, well, well, you know, of course, uh, you know, it really goes back to my summary. I think you still have to have a really good eye on what's going to be approved here in terms of new residential housing. Is it going to be a deal breaker, in my opinion, if it all gets approved? The answer is no. I don't see this, even if everything came online, um, it, will it cause a little bit of problems in terms of capacity? Yeah. But, I mean, you, you know, I'm seeing some communities we, you know, West Windsor I work with, they've, they've got two or 3,000 housing units coming online. You don't have that kind of problem. Um, I do see the prevailing age structure here is at some point it's going to flip. Uh, it has to. You cannot have declining birth rates forever. In fact, in the last two years, the birth rates went up in both communities, which is telling me that you might see a, a flip of the, the trend at some point in time in the future. The problem is it's too far out right now to determine when that's going to be. So I would say a little bit of a takeaway is that you are going to have some declining enrollment, but in the near term, uh, particularly at the lower levels, but you are still going to have some of those bigger cohorts moving through the system that's going to cause the enrollment to keep going up at the high school level. Thank you. You're welcome. Hmm. Lada? In terms of uh, um, in terms of the analysis in ter the in ter uh, of the yield per household, um, private school students are not included in either the. That's correct. So because I married the jo the district's database, this is strictly public school children. Okay. And, and I will also say that those public those yields that you saw on those tables are are high. Um, the typical ones, what I work with a lot of districts, are around 0 0.8 or 0 0.9 per household. It's 1.1, 1.2 here. Okay. Um, and then um, we also have movement between township and borough, mm -hmm. and so that's also not included as well. Is that correct? About what's? Just that if someone moved from the township oh. and had kids and. Right. No, I, I don't have intra uh, moving within the community since you're all part of the same umbrella for okay. schooling. Um, and my last question. I was confused about the uh, like the 25 years uh, residents, the tw 25 plus residents. It seems like they're the biggest number of potential home sales. Like they're 24 percent in the borough and 25 percent in the township. Mm -hmm. So what you did is you extrapolated a a a, uh, a percentage turnover rate for them on an annual basis, Correct. and then. I assume that those long-held homes that have never ever sold will have a similar turnover rate to ones that we had data for just a year prior, uh, you know, like 24 years who we, we did have data for them. But so the last 20 years, have we seen an increase in enrollment? I mean, over a trending of mm -hmm. students joining the district. So now, are we at the end of one cycle and the beginning of a new oh, cycle? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, it, it appears that is catching up to you. I think the age structure, in, in particularly in Morris County, I'm going to say that. Uh, I have uh, numerous clients in, in the county, and you're all showing the same kind of thing. And, you know, unlike the initial slide I showed you in the report where each community's population continues to go up, it doesn't work that way for school districts. It's almost like a roller coaster. You will see peaks and valleys. So I do believe that your your that period of enrollment increase is probably over because you did see the stabilization. That's a telltale sign. When you start to see stable enrollment for a three or four year period after a period of increasing, which mm -hmm. you did have, um, then it can start to go the other way. And I believe that's right on your doorstep. And so then I guess following up on that, um, you know, some of the new construction that has taken place are much bigger than what was. So the new constructions are five, six bedroom homes, 
but there's no correlation between the size of the home and the number of kids that people are having? That's what we're finding. So okay. you can get the McMansions that have uh, the five-bedroom home with the movie theater in one room and, you know, the gym in the other, and it doesn't necessarily translate to kids. Okay. Yeah. So the, I, mean, and I guess so, not to be pessimistic, but if the worst case scenario in terms of using those turnover rates, if we are at the end of one cycle, then we could see an uptick of 300 students. Yeah, and that would, that would be if lightning struck all five times in one place. I mean, okay. that to me is not going to happen. But I gave you the worst of the worst possible scenario. Okay. I just have a quick question and one that we talked about when we had our meeting prior to this. Um, just to talk about, for board members, it's on page 54 if you wanted to look, about projected enrollments for our elementary schools. Our elementary schools seem to be where we see pockets of overcrowding in certain buildings. Um, and we've been watching these numbers closely over the past few years and discussing as a board possibly reallocating some of those numbers to try to take the pressure off some buildings and, you know, and move them. Um, so you had shared with us in committee that there's a possibility to use some of this data and the information that you collected and to use what you have to help us best inform decisions, use different mapping devices to be able to look at those numbers more specifically to that elementary school population. Correct. Can you share with the board um, some of that information? Sure. So uh, I'll even go into greater detail than we had in our meeting. So. Um, let me go back. So this, this is the slide. This is actually the page you're yeah, referring that's the to. One, yeah. But I'm going to go to something else. Um, so we'll I have a GIS analyst that created these shape files. They're called shape files of your elementary attendance zones. I want to get back to the original ones right there. So once we have initial see. zones, we can tweak them and um, pull particular areas in or out of where they are right now. And um, with these student counts that have already been put into a map, we can then see how many students would be in those new zones. And we do that not just for a one-year period, but a five- or six-year historical period, because what we want to do is see is what would, this, what would the enrollment projections be in the new zones if we do sh reshape what those boundaries look like. So that's the process. So we're about halfway there. We already have the shape files, which are those pictures you see right in front of us. Now, if we want to tweak them to have more balance within the district, we can easily do that and see what the impact would be and what would be what I refer to as this disruption rate, which is simply what percentage of students would no longer be going to the current zone that they're in. Thank you. Hey, Michelle, anything else? Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, Great. Thank you, Dr. Grape. If I could just follow up, I'm going to say the word redistrict. I know we're, we're dancing around it, but... I try not to use that word. Yeah, I know, but <laughs> I'm going to say it because we've been talking about it for, for quite a while. We well, as you know, we currently have a K-3, to three, three K-3s, and then a 4-5. Mm -hmm. Could some of these models help us to decide if a possible K-5 to five in all four buildings is a better approach than trying to, you know, shift everybody around within the K-3s? to threes? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you, you, the hard work is, you know, of course, there's additional work to be done, but the groundwork is there. And we could easily determine what the K to 5 enrollments would be in each one of those buildings, uh, depending upon how you lay out the new boundaries. Absolutely. Okay. But we can use the math to help us yes. determine disruption rates. And traditionally, I mean, K to 5 is a more traditional model, correct, Dr. Lasusa, for elementary? Similar to what we have. Right, okay. I was just curious if we could use the math. I, I have no feelings mm -hmm. in one direction. It's just a mathematical question. Can we use the data to um, determine that? It's not so much mathematical as it's, it's a more of a mapping situation. Right. So uh, without getting too technical, I'll just kind of tell you what we do is all the points of students, just picture kids living points on that map. We uh -huh. can then say in a, in a mapping query, how many students now live in this new zone? Okay. And then do that um, going forward. We can actually figure out how many students would there be in five years to make sure you have capacity in those buildings as well. Okay, excellent. A ton of data. And just my last question is on inward migration. Mm -hmm. You talk a lot about in inward migration, um, you know, in pre-five-year-olds. Yep. It, it seems like a lot of calls or emails come in about middle school and high school, a lot of inward migration at the at the higher grades. So regardless of our 
kind of trail off in the, you know, pre-K to K or even K to three, it seems like we still get a tremendous amount of inquiries that people just move here, middle school, high school. You might, but the data is not showing okay. that kind of surplus compared to the other grade levels. So, okay. for instance, um, from grade six and up, the survival ratios were mostly just below one. Okay. So a barely an outward migration, which I would almost say it's practically stable. So you may be getting people to come in here, but I also think with the plethora of private schools around here, for high school particularly, that you probably lose a good portion to there as much as you do gain people coming in where it balances it out. Right. Excellent. Okay. So, I mean, the general takeaway is we're in good shape. We're not going to be selling off buildings by the same token we're not going to be overcrowded either that we have children hanging out the windows that's we're, how we're, i see it we're fair less your is that <laughs> nobody's hanging out the window nobody's hanging out the window and we're not selling off real estate but we're going to f at least in the pr the accuracy out for five years even given the, what you know about the redevelopment we're fairly stable and in good shape given the construction we've done over the last say seven years correct i would agree with that okay does anybody else have any other questions I'm sure we'll have some questions later during our public commentary, but um, we're moving. <laughs> Dr. LeSouza, are we moving right over to Ms. Chase? Yes, we are. That is a tough act to follow, Ms. Chase. Thank <laughs> you very much. All right, thank you very much. Dr. Gripp, thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Yes, the video will be posted and the slides will be available on the website and the video itself for the meeting will be posted if you want the commentary behind it as well. Well, I s <laughs> Every year the district is required by the state of New Jersey to report out on uh, standardized test results as required by the state of New Jersey. Um, and this year uh, we're going to do that, but we also need to spend a little bit of extra time on talking about high school graduation requirements. Uh, and Ms. Chase will detail this, but essentially since the introduction of PARC, uh, almost every cohort of graduates has had a different set of requirements that they've needed to demonstrate in order to graduate high school in New Jersey. And last spring, for those of you who may be high school parents, especially parents of sophomores last spring, uh, the state issued clarified guidance that kind of changed um, what most in di districts had interpreted as what students needed in order to graduate. After the state did that, that was in May, uh, at, in June they then kind of retracted and said we're issuing different um, rules that we hope will be adopted by the State Board of Education. The State Board of Education then rejected those rules or at least didn't vote on them for approval. Uh, and then it was just two weeks ago, uh, or a week and a half ago I should say, that um, the State Board of Education reached a compromise agreement with the Commissioner of Education over new requirements. Uh, so we're going to spend some time talking about this because it's been frustrating from our point of view and it has created uh, a lot of confusion not just in Chatham but in districts throughout New Jersey. So we'll talk about all of that uh, right now. Okay, as Dr. Lasusa said, I have a few slides. Um, the, the entire presentation is about 20 slides in length. Um, I certainly will not do the level of statistical analysis that the demographer, the demographer did. Um, so let me just start with an overview of the uh, statewide assessing test, testing schedule for the 2018-2019 school year. This is what the state had put out last spring so that districts can, in planning their calendar for the upcoming school year, consider these dates uh, and make sure that we have an opportunity to test our students. Uh, up into this would... This would have been the third, last year was the third administration of PARC. Uh, one of the regulations, the, one of the proposals in the regulations that Dr. Lususa mentioned actually includes a name change from the PARC assessment to the New Jersey Student Learning Assessment, which I'll talk about in a few slides. So um, 
as Dr. Lasusa said, there were some regulations that were proposed um, to change what we currently have, which is in the, the current regulations column, and then the amendments that were proposed on October 30th. Right now, the guidance from the New Jersey P Department of Education to school districts is that we follow what our current regulations um, with the understanding that these changes may happen. For, needless to say, that's putting some districts in uh, precarious situations because it's tough for planning out when we don't know for sure uh, what will happen. But just to highlight a few of the changes that um, were proposed. So as it currently stands, we assess students at the end of grades 9, 11, and 9, 10, and 11 at the high school level. The amendments include a reduction in testing at grade 11 for students in ELA. Currently, uh, in the area of mathematics, students are provided are given end of unit assessments in Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2. The proposals include a change from that, removing um, Algebra 2 from that, um, just an, an undergraduate cor course math in 9th and 10th graders in Algebra 1 and Geometry, or Geometry and Algebra 2. So it would be for students at the grade level as opposed to the end of course. The graduation assessment requirements for passing the assessments would stand as they are, which would include a requirement for students to pass the ELA 10 and Algebra 1. Um, there's also another option that has been included, and it's, it's differed, as Dr. Lususa said, for each cohort that we've seen over the past couple of years. But there are pathways that students can um, access once they take certain park assessments. So if a student does not pass a park assessment, for example, an ELA 10, there are a menu of options that students can, um, I don't want have access to to demonstrate proficiency in ELA and they include some of the things that are listed up here. The ACT, the SAT, the PSAT, um, the um, these are acronyms. We, we actually administer the ACCUPLACER, but then there's a, an assessment for the armed forces that's included. Um, so another proposal is when these students gain access to these menu of alternative assessments, as it stands right now, students would have had to sit for all park assessments in ELA and mathematics, and there's some convert, there's a proposal to just have students sit for the ELA and Algebra 1 so that they can access um, the ELA 10 and the Algebra 1 so that they can access there. So it would be a reduction of seat time for testing for students so that they can access these menus. And, and it's a, just an interesting thing to note that many of our students, well, the majority of our students participate in these other um, avenues, you know, PSAT, ACT, and SAT. So we're not finding um, that to be a concern with regard to having students take those assessments. And the district has chosen to administer ACCUPLACER for students who are having some difficulty passing these assessments. And we've been doing that. This would, this past year was our second year in administering those assessments. Um, another change that was proposed as part of the October 3rd conversation is, um, as I mentioned, a change in the name. So Common Core is gone. We now have New Jersey Student Learning Standards, and PARC will change to New Jersey Student Learning Assessments to, um, I suppose the thought process there was to align it more to the standards that we currently have, the language surrounding the standards. There's also been a proposal to reduce the length and the time of the tests. So in many grade levels, we'll see that currently students are assessed for three units. And when the proposals, if were put forward, there are two units that would be tested, which obviously would result in a release in test, a decrease in testing time. We don't have this specific information with the upper level mathematics time. I reached out to the Department of Education and was told that that information would be coming in the near future. But again, this causes a little bit of a difficult situation for us when we're trying to plan um, these kinds of assessments and the time needed to administer. So I'll get into our, our actual data right now. And one of the requirements from the DOE is that we report out how the district is performing as a whole, and then we take a look at how subgroups are performing. So this is just a slide that captures the uh, number of valid test scores that we've had in ELA and mathematics, and I just used a two-year comparison. And you could see that because of the graduation requirements, we did have a group, of, we did have a decline in the upper grades. 
Um, we're currently looking in the high school administration, along with Dr. Lasusa and me, are having conversations about what to do if our great current juniors will need to take the grade 10 test because many of them, as you can see from these slides, did not sit for that assessment because the thought was that they had met the graduation requirement having sat for ELA 9 um, and meeting their alternative assessments. So we'll begin with a district to state comparison and then we'll talk about some of the subgroup comparisons that we see. So park proficiencies are broken down into five levels and this chart clearly shows the five levels and the percentage of students at each grade level who have fallen into each of those proficiency levels. And just a quick thing to point out, um, if you look at the numbers within the green box over to the right, the darker blue column is actually the results from the New Jersey state, uh, any student, the percentage of students who have met or exceeded standards. And then to the left of that, you could see how we in district um, actually performed with percentages in meeting or exceeding standards. And you can clearly see that we have very performed very well in comparison to the state. And you can look at that in this um, chart here, which provides a, a visual representation of the same data. Just an interesting thing um, to take note of is one of the graduation requirements um, with regard to the, the state assessment, which will be, we'll know the name of it soon, um, is for students to pass ELA grade 10 assessment. And I, I, I wanna point out that when you look at, um, for the state, the state has a 49.9 passing rate for those students in, who have met the graduation requirement according to grade 10. And Chatham were, were above, but again, um, it's something to take note of that if this remained a requirement and that was the only pathway for students to demonstrate proficiency, the state would have a large number of students who did not um, meet graduation requirements. So this is the subgroup data and I formulated, I, I put it in a format similar to I did with the district. We have our five levels of proficiency. We have um, how the district performed in level four meeting expectations or exceeding. But that dark navy column over to the right, I need to make a note that this is not data from 20, the 2017-2018 test administration. The state has not released that data, so we were not able to do any kind of comparative analysis. So this is last year's data, so we're talking about different cohorts of students, and actually uh, there may have been some differences in the actual test design. But with that in mind, um, we could still make note that when we look at our population of white students, we're seeing that um, those who performed this year outperformed uh, the students who, the percentage rates for the assessment of other white students within the state um, from the last year. This is a similar uh, slide for information for students whose ethnicity has been reported as Asian. And I just want to make note that I did not report out on any information that had a population of less than 30. Um, we don't want to bring to attention any specific student. And when you get to data at that level, there's the, there's the chance that um, identity might be known and it would no longer be um, generalizations. So again, our Asian students uh, outperform the state. And here's a slide that shows the same, inform the same form uh, for information, but for our special education students in mathematics. And you could see that when compared to the state, our special education students are performing well above uh, what the state's special education population is. So those were that was the information for English language arts. We also administered, um, as per requirements, an assessment in mathematics for PARC. And so we'll follow the same process. We have how the district performed in comparison to the state. That's for the current year. We do have that data for state um, total population. And again, just pointing out with the red bar, the Algebra One assessment being a graduation requirement, more than, ha more than half of um, the students in New Jersey would not have met that requirement to pass Algebra One to demonstrate proficiency for graduation um, requirements. But we in Chatham did very well. Another visual, again, we see the um, decline uh, that's similar to the state there. And it's always concerning if you see a trend that's not similar, but this is something that's similar within um, both our home district and what we're seeing throughout the state. 
mathematics, we um, are here. This is a slide that shows the grade level outcomes for mathematics with our population whose ethnicity has been reported as white. Uh, we have don't have the numbers to report out on grade eight because the N was less than 30, but you can see that we're finding a trend similar to the data that we've seen on the previous slides, which is that our students do very well. Um, the geometry is a little bit lower, but that may take into account the fact that we our population, our number of valid test scores is, is very low. Um, so that's something to take note of. This is our subgroup data for our students whose ethnicity is reported as Asian. And then we have um, some information again for our subgroup of special education students in mathematics and just it's important to note again we're doing very well with this population we tend to we look at information such as this in addition to district-wide assessments that are given to make sure that we are um, our students are performing as well as we'd like them to so I just want to thank the board uh, for your continued support and if you have have any questions as Ms. Weber may okay Yes. The, the most current information from the state about graduation requirement, Algebra 1. In our district, our, a lot of our students take that course at the, high, at the middle school. Mm -hmm. So do they, does that middle school eighth grade park now, I, I feel like I can't even talk about the new name. We're going to call it park. The, so let's say students who were in eighth grade last year took the test, they passed the test. Is that assumed that they have met that portion of their high school graduation requirement or do they need to sit again for another math assessment at the high school well my understanding based on the regulations is that they would have to sit for geometry and algebra 2 dr lucius is that what you're but i thought algebra 2 came off on i'm, I'm sorry um yeah yes they would have taken the algebra 1 as eighth graders so they would need to take a end of course math as ninth and 10th graders, either Algebra 1, which they would have taken as 8th graders, or Geometry and Algebra 2. So, but that's misleading. This the way I read it. It was like it had to be ninth for the Algebra 1. So since they're taking Geometry in, eighth, in ninth grade, most um, a lot of our students, then they take that, check that box, they're done. They did the Algebra 1 in 8th grade. As, I think know, I may, I think I might have um, not been clear with that. Yeah, they I would just need because we they would to have to take very an informed. end of year end of the year assessment. So as mathematics, they would take an end of course math in ninth grade. So if it, we are talking about a student who took algebra one and eighth, their end of course ninth grade math would be geometry, and then they would be taking um, algebra two in tenth grade. Right, but algebra two seems to be where we were struggling. Was that not when we looked at that data? No, am I missing? So I didn't look. Yeah. Okay. So that, just to be clear, because I think there may be a misconception about, because in the past that algebra that, that was taken up in the eighth grade was counted or was applied toward that high school requirement when they moved to the high school. I think we need to be very forthcoming with information to parents about what what is actually, I know this is an ever-changing situation, this information is changing literally by the day, but just to make sure we need these kids to sit for the test. and regardless of the outcome of the test, they have to sit for the test. We can't really help anyone if they don't sit for the test. So even if they come and sit for the test and log on, at least we have a better opportunity to help them than when they didn't come at all. So I just think the more information we can push out as best we can, and I know it's changing all the time, I think that's the most important thing to out that we can take away from this because we we didn't get in this situation because we didn't do our job. We got in this situation because the state changed th the rules of the game. But if kids had sat for the test, we would have had an easier time working, regardless of what the score was, you know, to be able to help, you know, help them. So the, the first thing is that um, if, they took a, if they took and passed algebra in eighth grade, mm -hmm. they've met the graduation requirement. So that's but algebra they need, one. But they need to take a test at the end of ninth grade and 10th grade and they don't need to pass it. Okay. So they have to sit and that take geometry so and algebra two in ninth and 10th grade, but they don't need to pass those tests in order to graduate. Because they've already hit the algebra one that goes into that yes. ELA test. Got in it. terms of, sure. Karen, can you go back to the math, one of the math slides? In terms of algebra two geometry, um, and we could actually go to English too, but we, if, you, if you look at this one, since all of our kids, so mm. 
Most yeah. of our kids take algebra in eighth grade. Mm -hmm. That's why we only have 35 students in grade eight taking right, the right. grade eight math test. And that's why the percent passing is so low because those students are, tend to be our weaker math students or mm -hmm. our weakest math students. So 90% of the kids are taking algebra, 10% of them are taking grade eight. The kids who take algebra and pass, what has been happening is they don't then bother taking geometry I or know. algebra two. Same thing on the ELA side, if you go to that, Karen, they, once they take ELA 9, because the last year's kids thought they had to sit for ELA 9, uh, or two years ago, whenever it was, they don't bother continuing on and taking the test mm -hmm. because they thought that they didn't need to. Um, that changed in the spring. It's different now. So we've been having conversations since the State Board of Education meeting on October 3rd. We met the within a day of that to try to sort this out and we're close to having it sorted out uh, because it seems it seems it seems complicated but it's even more complicated than no, this no, no, because we have students who are in 11th grade who have passed ELA 9 but then they skipped ELA mm -hmm. 10 we've got kids who passed geometry but never took algebra because they didn't feel like it in eighth grade we have kids all over the place uh, what we likely will need to do um, as a result of this is um, give another park session uh, before the December holiday. And we'll have to have three or four delayed openings or early dismissals mm -hmm. here at so the high school. And we'll have to basically get all of the kids who have not yet passed algebra, either because they didn't bother taking it or because they took it and didn't pass, as well as the kids who never took ELA 10 in particular. Because many, many of our students who are in, in junior year now, I'd missing. say close to 300 of them, didn't take ELA 10 last spring because they didn't, at the time, the guidance published on the DOE website told them that they did not need to sit and take ELA 10. Uh, so th that, we will be finalizing that, communicating mm -hmm. all of that to, to parents uh, pretty well, soon, and then yeah. we'll be back here probably at the next board meeting to amend the calendar to show that we need uh, delayed openings on three or four days in December. I do agree we need to prioritize those group of students, but I think going into the new testing cycle, dealing with our eighth graders, ninth graders, whatever, we need to be, if you are in the class of 2000, whatever, this is what you have to do. And well, if you're the, the and like people who choose to opt out, they need to know what the consequences will be. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll just say we've been communicating very clearly that mm -hmm. uh, these are graduation requirements. We yes. don't know what the repercussions will be if your child chooses not to take the test. So we have done that. Like Karen said, these regulations were approved by the state board october 3rd but there's a 60-day period for public comment and they don't take effect until those 60 days elapse once that we're, we're going to have to test kids even right, like right, before right, right. then probably or, or right around then or put put it all in motion and then once it's all squared away um we can communicate more forcefully for the upcoming students mm -hmm. thank you go ahead mary can you let my children take geometry over the summer and then come into the high school in Algebra 2? And would they be required to take an Algebra 2 test and then like a pre-calc test as a sophomore? There, there's no pre-calc assessment there's for not. the state. No. There's not. So oh, I thought they said they had to take an assessment at the end of ninth and the end of 10th. So right now the guidance for students who have taken assessments outside of the district is like, because we have some students who have been um, in other states, maybe they've taken Algebra 1 or Geometry in another state and they never took the park assessment. The most recent guidance was that those students need to take that assessment. So I would assume that a student who would have taken Geometry outside of the district and have earned, that may fall under the same um, direction as that but, but we would have to contact the DOE and see for okay. we have so many si we have so many s situations it's literally going almost student by student and looking at these variables like you have students like Mike said who are juniors who haven't taken ELA 8 they passed ELA 9 they just have to sit for this or you have some students who have taken algebra 1 have not passed the algebra 1 but they've met them they've met the other assessments that could they can use to demonstrate proficiency but then they have to sit for geometry and algebra 2 but they don't have to pass it's it's just very layered and it's a it's a very time consuming process to go through all of this information Sorry so for the out of state kids who come in having taken stuff. Yeah. Wow. It's mostly Doug Walker. <laughs> yeah, but we I mean the most in the kids that are impacted immediately are our juniors, right? Seniors yes. sh ship yes. a sale, they can take at yes. park. Our juniors 
have to be specifically told because these are the kids that won't mm -hmm. graduate and their parents are going to be shocked. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you tell me my kid's not graduating? Mm -hmm. We're telling you now. Yes. But poor Mr. Walker, he's going to have to identify all the kids in junior year and somehow send out a communication where he gets a response. I don't know if John has to put it on the website where you have to check a box. You acknowledge that you received this, but somehow we need to make sure we t get e to each one of these parents to say your kid will not graduate unless they sit for these tests. You can opt out, but then you will not be graduating. So we just have to be very clear and identify those. We can't use these charts. These charts are, are useless. Uh, no, we agree. Absolutely and useless. Our conversations have been about that. We have the numbers of students who are in certain scenarios. We, um, Doug has gone through lists, and he's worked alongside our director of secondary education to make sure that the um, they have an accurate list of students in that situation, and we're we're making plans. It's um, and. There has been um, conversation with the team. We've met twice already, but actually three times already about this matter, um, and the communication will be made to those students because we don't. We want them. You know, we obviously want them to take the test. We don't want to find ourselves in a situation with a student who sure, is but not. But in order to even be eligible to use ACT or the SATs, they have, they to, have to sit yes. for the test. Yes, and we need to Opting make that out clear. Is not an option. No, we need to make that very clear because, as you said, the charts aren't clear. It's almost. Um, I've been saying th that those options that window that door does not open to those options unless you physically had a valid test score for the required assessments that students need to sit for and to have a valid test score you just show up and sign your name or do you actually have to put pen to paper we don't we're not sure we a valid test score has never been defined with regard to the number of tests but the students have to log on sit and and take some okay. answer some questions we just have to make that very clear so that folks are not shocked two years from now or a year and a half from now, why isn't my kid graduating? Mm -hmm. They're not graduating because they didn't sit for the park. And we're disrupting the, the schedule. We're, we're going to add three days of, at least three days of at the high school, correct? So we're going to disrupt the entire calendar, and that's what we have to do, so be it. But if you don't sit for the test, your student will not graduate. It's that simple. Um, yeah, so Jill, just to give you some numbers. So current 11th graders, we have 243 that didn't take ELA 10. Okay. We have another 20 that took it but didn't pass. So 263 students in grade, ele grade 11 now need to take the ELA 10. Uh, I need to look, but it's, it's upwards right of 300. It's right here in front of us. Those are it. last year's numbers, so look at grade 10 from last year. So 263 letters need to go out to 263. Yeah, well, so then on top of that, there are nine students who um, did not pass algebra but did pass ELA 10, and there are 55 of the 11th graders who never took the algebra one. Um, so it's you, you get yeah, the it's a mess. It's it's a big mess. So um, it's a mess. We're we're getting to the bottom of it. Okay. Uh, again, and I know this is no fault of the district and the, d the, the state keeps moving the cheese on this, but we just have to communicate to our parent community. How do we get from here to graduation for these students? Mm -hmm. That's it. That's all. I mean, quite am I, am I, does the board disagree? Our goal is to make sure these children graduate. I don't want, we're not playing this game with the state. Just bottom line, how do we get our kids to graduate? And the way they do that is to sit for the test. They don't have to be happy about it, but they have to sit there. We'll accommodate it. We'll change the schedule, but you have to come and sit for the test, period. It, it's just that simple. And, and I'm sorry. I'm just not going to feel sorry for you if your kid doesn't graduate if you chose not to sit for the test for some philosophical reason. It, it's just not going to work. Um, and Karen, I'm sorry. I, these charts are a little confusing to me, especially after the redistrict of uh, the uh, <laughs> demographer. But it might understand that this is the district number and this is yes. the state. Yes. Yes. So if you go to do this... Do when I looked at the special ed slide, are our special ed students far outperforming our general ed students compared to the state? You mean the gap between? State and district? In, in some grade levels, yes. Okay, in, in interesting. Some, in some grade levels, are the gap between our student pop, uh, special education population's performance with meeting or exceeding expectations in the states does is um, greater than our general ed. Right, that's interesting. They're rocking it. Excellent. Um, wait, wait, sorry, Mr. Ryan, Go ahead. If, you wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind, let me finish. Um, so, again, these charts are driving me nuts. Based on the data that you know, and, uh, I mean, Dr. LaSusa was able to r rattle off to me, you know, 243, 20, 263, minus 9, plus 55. Good luck. That was pretty good. Thank you. I wrote it down. Based on this, you can accurately 
definitively identify those students we have to target? Yes. Okay. And is in sending, I, I fear that sending a letter to some of these folks, you know, for whatever reason, the message isn't going to be sent home. Is there a way to get some type of positive consent? I received your notice, similar to opting out of the directory, or is there a way to get the message out? Because nobody's listening to this meeting. They're just not. Um, We'd have to look into that. And so you don't have access to certain things on Genesis. If you don't respond to certain prompts, um, then you are, you are temporarily locked out of Genesis until you can respond to the prompt. We'd um, I don't know. We need to look into that. I don't know if you can, if you can set that by individual student, and you would have to go in and set it probably by individual student. You know, we do that usually for a whole school or whole grade right, level. Right, but I think in this issue. case, if this is something, this is I, if, if you're talking three, you, I think if we have to take those measures, yep. we have to take them. Um, and then the other thing, can I ask one yeah, question? Sorry, and then we'll go um, to Mr. Ryan. I don't want to make more work for you or for Doug Walker or for anyone, but I think it would be in our best interest at this time to have posted on our website by graduation year, um, especially in our high school, so that parents who, is, who have multiple children at the high school with different children with different graduation requirements have access to that information and are informed and have a place to go to look. So mm -hmm. if you have a freshman and a junior and a senior, or whatever, a sophomore, junior, all those requirements may look different at some time. And you can then look at, and we can update that information as we get it. Mm -hmm. It might be weekly, it might be every year, but I think we need to treat each of our graduating classes right now as individual units and what, the, what they should be. And if we're talking about Algebra One and you took it at Chatham Middle School, then we need to note that there, but say you now also, and really just put it out, your child must sit for a ninth grade or 10th grade part. We recommend both. Mm -hmm. You know, and and we have we have had that information up on our website from the high that. school. The, like Mike had said, yeah. the challenge is the state changed but the I requirements. Think we need to put it back and in now we have to go changes. back and revise. And we're, we're happy, to, yeah. you know, we're obviously and going just to, to do, do that. It, you know, very, even yeah. in a different slide, mm -hmm. not even put it on a chart, different slide for each grade with mm -hmm. a different tab. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I think Mr. Ryan has a comment or yeah. question. Can you go back to the special education slides? Grade. There's less than 30 less than students, just like she oh, said. Less than 30. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Are there any? Um, is this the total population? Or in other words, are there any students that do not take the part yeah. test? Yes, we yes. have students who take the um, DLM, which is an assessment that um, for students who are special education who are um, have been identified as not being able to take this assessment, they take an alternate assessment, and I don't have that data with me. So we don't know how they're doing, the DLM. No, we, we would have to look at the DLM data. data. Um, we have, what, what is it, less than 1% of our population, I believe it I is? Don't, I don't know. No, we, we also have some students who might opt out, too. Okay. Valid test scores. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. exactly. Whatever that means. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Karen. Good luck. Keep us posted, though. We will. And let us know what we can do to help. Yeah. I mean, somehow we have to get the word out that folks have to sit for the test. That's that, sit for the test. But I think, in, and the overwhelming majority of kids will sit for the test. In their defense, what you just mentioned, we had the slides up from the DOE. We had the links. We, Mr. Grow had sent communication to parents at the beginning of the it year in the summer, and they changed that, th their guidance in May. And that's what put us in this predicament with so many kids in the junior class now, that we thought we would uh, exit from based on what the recommendations were from the commissioner in June, but that's what the state board and, didn't And it may change again. That they, if they do they're nothing, going to probably have to change Right, again. if they do nothing, 50% of the state will not graduate in two years, correct? Uh, well, if they do nothing, if they make no additional changes. If, well, they approved the changes that state if you don't pass Algebra 1 mm -hmm. or Geometry Algebra 2, you can have a certain score on the PSAT or the AccuPlacer or if the If you've SAT. sat for those mm -hmm. tests. Mm -hmm. Correct. If that's you haven't sat for those true. tests, you're, you're not graduating. So that's we right. don't know how many of um, students within the state have sat for those other assessments. I know in other districts they're facing challenges similar to us. They have a large population of students because they we were informed that if you pa took and passed ELA 9, you were okay You're good. Um, if you passed those other assessments too. So I we don't know what the state um, 
if, if those students are in situations where they've sat for all of the other parks or they have not, um, there's always the portfolio appeals process, but I that has that too has changed over the course of the year. So basically what happens is our students have to demonstrate meeting standards through a variety of other um, questions and, and test prompts, and we score them in-house, and then we give them to the DOE, and then they check off whether or not our students have met. Um, so if th that 49.9%, well, it would be the opposite of it. If the um, right. more than fifty percent of the state did not take those other assessments and had to go through the portfolio, then the state would be very overwhelmed with the number right. of um, portfolios they would be collecting. One just last question, sorry, but I, we, along with other districts, are in the same situation. We are not alone. There are districts across the state who are trying to piece this together. I think we need to strike why the iron is hot. I think we need to partner with districts, high-performing districts like ourselves, where I would go out to say that probably 95% of our graduation students who will take an ACT and SAT or a P PSAT, I might be wrong, but I think our numbers are significantly high. Those tests are a much more valid indicator of the performance levels of our students. They're measured against their peers in the state. They're measured against their peers across the country and internationally. I think we need to partner with these districts. I think we need to now go back to the Department of Education and say, enough, enough. If they want the money for this test, we'll give them the money for the test. But we have the ability to show that our kids are ready to graduate. And we're not going to be held back by one day, one time, and one test. Our kids are ready to graduate. And we have the numbers to show it. And many of these kids who have not sat for this test have test scores that will far exceed what the, this would tell us. So I think we need to to work with the Department of Education and partner with these other districts. We are a high performing district. Our kids are well prepared to graduate from high school. And this stress is not necessary and it should not be put upon our kids the junior year of high school. So I, I don't wanna make more work for anyone, but this is the time that we need to act and we need to speak out and we need to take the data that we have from these kids already and, and use that to our advantage because our test scores, ACT, SAT, PSAT, they exceed other districts. We for years had, and I don't know what it is this year, the highest in Morris County. It's time now for us to move forward. And if we as a board need to go with other boards and speak louder and prouder and do what we have to do, we will do it too. What's the purpose of it if they don't it's have to It's money. Them? They have to have a state assessment, the, the but it's ridiculous. A number of us are doing what you're, what exactly you're describing, Michelle. The Right now, it's not the Department of Education that's the issue. Right now, it's that some members of the State Board of Education and some members of the legislature, including Teresa Ruiz, mm -hmm. uh, believe that PARC is vital to um, ensuring that districts that are low performing are mm -hmm. appropriately assessing their kids, that districts that are high performing are not skating by and, and not doing what they should. And they really believe in PARC, and, in, and not just PARC, in any you know, standardized state test. I believe, like some of my colleagues, that it would be better for kids, including in poor, especially in poorer communities, to provide them the, 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 the plan or the PSAT mm -hmm. or the SAT or the ACT, yeah. spend the money on that because that yeah. will do more to improve their, you know, uh, uh, exposure to college Use level admissions it's, and so forth. And it would be money in the pockets to families because they wouldn't have to shell out privately to, to, to take the, the PSAT and those other oh. tests. Um, but that's not falling on, on you know, receptive ears right now. He, uh, Dr. Grip mentioned West Windsor Plainsboro. That superintendent just wrote a great piece about how Park is not scored by human beings, mm -hmm. ELA. The essays <laughs> are not scored, it's AI. Wow. So. The, the test results, the, the scores that we're getting are not even They're based not on a human scorer who has been trained someplace. It's going, being fed through a machine and, and there's a, you know, a, a score assigned to the writing. Wow. To the writing. That's right carefully. <laughs> that's amazing. Sorry. Thank you, Ms. Chase. I appreciate that. I apologize, uh, members of the community. We're getting to the public commentary. We'll try and get there as quickly as possible. Um, Dr. Lasusa, did you have anything else to add to your report? Well, Mr. Dequila has a 30-minute presentation now on the <laughs> state of facilities. I'm out. Is that okay? All right, that's it from me. Excellent. Thank you. All right, good luck, Peter. You get 30 seconds. I'm only kidding. Whatever you need. I was going to say I can do three minutes and less. <laughs> Um, just roughly again to report out that the, uh, the high school auditorium, the seats are scheduled to be delivered a week from tomorrow, and the construction, which is October 23rd, 
and then the construction company said the installation should take approximately seven business days. So hopefully come the end of uh, October, we should have seats in the auditorium and uh, ready to sit and relax and uh, take advantage of the beautiful space. Excellent. Uh, for the central office addition, interior work is ongoing. The sheetrock is uh, nearly completed. Uh, ceiling grids are being installed. Uh, bathroom tiling has worked. Um, the tentative substantial completion date is November 1st. Uh, I've already started to uh, gather some information and uh, seek some quotes on pricing and the best way to move the, the office once the building is complete. So when I have more information on that, I'll report out to everyone. And on the middle school auditorium, which is the last of the referendum projects that has not been uh, started yet, the architect has, we've had two meetings with the stakeholders. The architect is finalizing specifications and working on the bid documents. And that's all I have. And when, I'm sorry, when any, do you anticipate? Any questions? I do have one quick. Just when do you anticipate going out to bid on the on that last project, CMS? Um, we're working on finally uh, finalizing on that. We've had some asbest preliminary asbestos samples taken. Uh -huh. So based on the um, uh, the asbestos results, the January re the removal <laughs> of the asbestos will dictate when the project can be done. So depending what, we know that the tile floor contains asbestos in the auditorium, but that is an easy removal uh, since that is a non-friable asbestos and that can be done while the building is occupied. We don't know what other types of asbestos may or may not be in the building. Some of those we may, not, we may only be able to remove when the building is unoccupied. Okay. So until we have the reports from the environmental company, we cannot make a, uh, a solid construction schedule yet. Okay, the bids will go out by January? The, bid, the, the initial goal was for the bids to go out by January 1st. Okay. Uh, and then there's a period of time where they're out and then they come back in, it was either late January or early February, I think, and awarded right around that time. Okay, great. Uh, any questions for Peter on anything facilities related? Uh, great, we're gonna move over to committee reports. Uh, Ms. Kenny for personnel. Yes, uh, we met uh, on October 10th um, and we discussed uh, the coaches evaluation process for our sports teams and we also discussed leave replacements for the district. Excellent, thank you. Ms. Ciccarelli, curriculum is gonna meet next week, right? The 29th, yeah, we have not, no, we're, yeah, we're meeting on the 29th. We have not met since our last meeting. Okay, great. Uh, finance and facilities has not met, correct? 10-1. But we've already reported yeah, out on that. We've then. we have not had since then. Right? We have not had a meeting since no, then. I feel like we're always all together. I know, it's gotten a little too much. Uh, Ms. Clark, do you mind doing policy in Sal's absence? Thank you for filling in for um, Sal. The policy just met before this meeting. Um, we went. Th we had a meeting with the demographer to get to brief us on his presentation tonight. Um, we had the opportunity to review a policy um, regarding hiring practices and background checks for new employees. Um, and the committee discussed uh, tuition students and taking a look at the policy in regards to uh, students coming to Chatham paying tuition. Excellent, thank you. Uh, moving over to the liaison reports. I do not have anything currently for the borough. Michelle, anything for the township? Excellent. Um, athletic boosters, Mrs. Ciccarelli. They met on October 2nd and um, basically they talked about um, Specific coaches request that they had and up for discussion and vote was the cross country and track tent in the amount of $2,000 that they're looking for. And new business that they discussed was the um, balloon arch for Cougar Weekend. They're asking people to send photos for the website and Facebook group if anybody has any photos from any sporting events. And they had some preliminary info on the booster bash. Okay, excellent. Oh, performing arts, I'm gonna fill in for Sal on that. Uh, just uh, congratulations to the marching band and, the and their director, Mr. Brian Conte, on a great season. Uh, the marching band received a first place at both Randolph and Hanover Park competitions, which are their last competitions of the season. Um, they were also awarded best music and best overall effect, so congratulations to the marching band. They had a fantastic season. And the, we we're mentioning the auditorium. Hopefully the seats will come in on time. And we're planning on a, um, an open house initially for November 1st from 8 to 9. It happens to follow the high school PTO meeting. 
We're going to have students that will be on hand to walk people through the new space and talk about each of the new features. And we're hoping to have side-by-side -side, um, slides, you know, what it used to look like and what it currently looks like. So that if you can come out, um, October or November 1st will be the first open house. And then we're hoping to have maybe some additional open houses as each group starts to perform. So uh, the last item is the fall play is November 15th, 16th, and 17th. So please mark your calendar. That will be the first. Will that be the first official? performance in the new space excellent it's uh, radium girls so it's a drama and the musical will be in the winter if you have any questions see me after on that uh, education foundation Ms. Kenny uh, I don't have it updated at this point okay when is the um, it November 3rd. it's November 3rd November 3rd is the trivia night it is it okay great great November 3rd trivia night and recreation hasn't met and district cabinet on October 3rd and um, we basically just clarified some of the questions that people had about the um, meeting that we had on 10-1 and the presentation by the um, chiefs of police and our um, vote to allow Mike to move forward on uh, class 3 officers and they meet again on November 7th. November 7th. Great thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I make a motion to pass the minutes of October 1st and October 10th, public and executive sessions. Uh, thank you, and second both of those. Uh, Peter, can you just tell us um, who needs to abstain in which? Uh, on October 10th, I just need abstentions from Ms. Kenny, Mr. Ryan, and Mr. Valenti. So I was just going to do two separate. Yes, please. It, it'll be easier. Uh, the minutes of October 1st, Ms. Chambers? Yes. Ms. Ciccarelli? Yes. Ms. Clark? Yes. Ms. Kenny? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Valenti? Yes. And Ms. Weber? Those passed 7 yes. 0. Uh, the minutes of 1010, Ms. Chambers? Yes. Ms. Ciccarelli? Yes. Ms. Clark? Yes. Uh, Mr. Ken Ms. Kenny? Yes. Ms. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Valenti? Yes. And Ms. Weber? Yes. Those passed 404. Excellent. So I apologize it took this long, but we have our first opportunity for public commentary. A hearing of citizens during the public commentary section of the agenda is an opportunity for any member of the public to be heard about issues which are or are not topics scheduled for the current meeting. To help facilitate an orderly meeting and to permit all to be heard, speakers will be asked to limit their comments to a reasonable length of time. If you wouldn't mind um, going up to the microphone, introducing yourself, and if you could sign in. Oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, we'll just give you a general time. I know you don't go over, Paul, but. Uh, Paul Ivins, uh, have lived in the borough for 26 yeah. years now. I can't believe it. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the Board of Education. I'm just sitting here. I've, I've probably been to about 10 meetings, and this was most definitely the most data-rich uh, <laughs> Board of Education meeting. But you guys were tackling some pretty significant uh, uh, topics, both the demography and then uh, obviously the park testing complications with the state. So, so thank you for that. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about is a demographic analysis of the paddle team uh, <laughs> on a lighter note. So that, that's what I'm here to, to talk about. I want to give you guys a quick update and uh, request your funding support for the, for the paddle team. Last year was the first year as a high school sport after two years as a club at uh, Chatham High. Um, as a club, we had about 20 kids each year or each week that, that came out for the, uh, the clinics that we did. Last year, we had 42 students participate on the paddle team. Um, it was the first varsity high school paddle team in the U.S., uh, and it was a very successful uh, um, season for us. We had matches and did all kinds of stuff, and the, and the kids really enjoyed the, uh, their time. We had no graduating seniors on the team, so we had 42 kids with no seniors who left the high school. We know about three kids who are not going to come back. We do high school, we do clinic. The high school kids teach clinics to the middle schoolers. And we've averaged around 60 per year for the first two years. Last year, the, the high school kids taught 86 middle school children, of which 22 are, were uh, eighth graders coming into ninth grade uh, this year. So we have ninth, uh, 22 ninth graders who played in those clinics. We've gotten response from 11 of them already. We did a meeting in, in, at the end of last year in uh, June, just an informational meeting to get some feedback. And like 15 uh, parents and players that were new uh, entering freshmen rising freshmen came and said we we want to we want to play next year uh, and then we had uh, we're hearing another 15 or so kids who hadn't played before that were already in the high school last year want to join so we're probably going to have in the neighborhood of 55 to 60 kids um, with that 
I would just like to request, I know we've talked about funding, and I know you, you guys were not able to fund us last year. Uh, we recognize the situation of the, uh, of the funding uh, at the Board of Education, Class 3 officers. You know, they're, they're a big fish to fry. Um, but we respectfully request that you guys consider funding in some way uh, the paddle team this year. Thank you. Uh, I'm Lisa Schroeder. I'm also one of the parent advisors for the paddle team. And I just have a question for the board about the activity fee. Uh, last year and the years previously, the activity fee was $100. I know prior to that it was higher and you reduced it. This year it went up again to $150 per student. And I'm just curious if any of that funding could be potentially directed toward the paddle team or the girls hockey team and those other things that are looking for funding. I just kind of want to raise our hand and say, we're here for that if you're available. And I'm just curious where that additional $50 per student, where is that, what is that allocated for? If anyone has any idea or feedback. Yeah, I can just say that the finance committee and any member here on the finance committee can chime in has discussed um, how to reinvest some of that money in aside from just letting it fall to the operating budget. Um, sailing was the first was the first activity or sport on the list, and that's what got the funding uh, for this year. Okay. Uh, and then we've also uh, purchased some items that we thought uh, the marching band needed. And we will continue, or the finance committee, I should say, will continue to look at the, the various requests and needs of the other activities that might warrant funding. Great. Just keep us in mind. Thank you. The primary driver was to be able to give funds to the underfunded, mm -hmm. right? That was one of the, okay, just want to make sure. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional um, public commentary? There's another opportunity at the end if something comes up. Okay. You could just jump in. Lisa will step aside. <laughs> hi, how are you? Head in the pictures. Um, so, hi, Jennifer McNally, and, and I'm in the township. I just have a quick question. Um, with the demographer that was here tonight, there's a lot of information that was presented, and I think a lot of it is contingent on activities that take place with the Chatham Township Committee and the Chatham Borough Council. And is there a representative from the Board of Education that will communicate these findings to the Chatham Township Town Committee and the Chatham Borough Council? Does that information get communicated to those entities because um, I didn't see anybody here tonight you know tonight representing and is there somebody assigned from those two groups yes to participate to, yes to both okay. of those okay there's somebody I didn't see anybody in the audience tonight from either one of them coming you know to what though it, they so. could be watching online oh, and okay. they could watch it okay. right. tomorrow okay you know right. it's taped and posted um, it seemed like a significant amount of data that is yes. impactful both directions the municipalities um, both have liaisons okay. to the Board of Ed okay so yes and information is shared okay. you know freely from the district to okay. the municipalities okay that's great my only question thank you very much we're all in this together. All righty. So I'm going to close the first uh, public commentary section session. There's another at the end. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm just going to move through the agenda. And again, if it appears that we move through them quickly, it's because they're posted on Friday, so we have the whole weekend to read through them. Um, they're posted for all to read over the weekend if they choose. Um, so just moving along. Uh, personnel, Ms. Kenny, would you mind? want A16 on the main agenda and A17 through uh, 19 on the um, addendum. And also on the addendum, there are changes on to item 4 and 10 that have additions. Okay. So there's 4 and oh, 10 are adjustments yeah, and then adding 17, 18, 19 to the addendum. Just looking for a second. second. Excellent. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Ms. Grant or Dr. Lasusa or anybody from the <laughs> personnel committee on any of those items? Am I reading this right? The, the district coaching staff comes under personnel? Yes. Um, can, I know in previous meetings um, we've talked about the wrestling team. Um, did we come to any conclusion on that? Like uh, the finance co committee kept saying they were going to review that and review that. I, I just was wondering where we stood on the. It depends I see on the we're numbers. We're allotting money for that, so yeah. I don't know where the numbers stood from a, a participation. Um, I had spoken to uh, Bill Labrera this morning. Uh, they were down in front of the, if I get the initials right, the NJSIAA, mm -hmm. um, who approved that the. 
Chatham wrestling team can be joined with the summit team. So they are having the first of the, uh, I guess, meet and greets to see if the two teams will meld together. Uh, I believe it was tomorrow or in this week. So as it appears now, we will have a combined, uh, we're laying the ground roads to have a combined wrestling team with Summit High School. What that will mean is the Chatham will not need to pay coaching funds, but Chatham will have some increased transportation cost compared to the season of last year and having our own team. And the reason for this is we currently have uh, 10 wrestlers, but we do not have, Chatham alone does not have enough to form a team or to have a viable match against uh, another team since we don't have um, a wrestler for each weight class. So it's kind of where you'd have empty slots. And we're hoping that combining with Summit, that will make a formidable team so that they can have competitive uh, matches against other schools. So more to, more to come as Bill continues you know, his uh, pioneer efforts. So, so we are assigning the money for a wrestling coach really to like towards the program then? Is that what I understand? Like you said, we're not going to have a coach, or are we? Or are we going to kind of hold that money because we the, need it? The, the funds now are putting in uh, as a placeholder. Okay. If they're um, okay. obviously, if we proceed as I discussed, some of that money will be need to reallocated to the original wrestling transportation budget, transportation. and then some of it may go for other sporting needs or back into the operating budget to be used as finance determines. Yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely. It's I totally get that. For now. Yeah, th I just don't understand reason. what that meant because he said I, we weren't going to have – I, I just was yeah. trying to figure that out. So we're going to share that. And we have to bus the kids over to Summit then? Yes. Because yeah. it's a different town? Yeah, yes. Yeah, okay, because so, so within our town, we don't need to move children. Right. We don't have to be responsible for moving children? Well, the, the, whole issue, the whole issue comes within, you know, if the practices are with, within walking distance. So obviously walking the high school students – can easily hear or make it to either the middle school or the high school. The, I don't remember if it was, I don't remember if it was yeah, the finance committee like or the board in the past determined that if the students were practicing offsite, they wanted to transport the students so that we did not create any liability of having high school students drive to certain locations, especially for a winter sport where they may possibly be out in inclement weather. But, okay, which but that's what the wrestling team did, though, because we had the dedicated wrestling room in Mountain View. Yeah. Mm -hmm. do we H historically, we typically have not transported within Chatham. Okay. And even to a certain degree, I don't believe we've transported the bowling team to Main Street on uh, Madison. Right. We started transporting them when they moved over to Route 10, whatever the place was. Um, that's a discussion for the Facilities Finance or Policy Committee. Okay. Uh, if we want to change that practice, obviously it would be co very costly to yeah. – to, to bring kids wherever you know they might need to go but historically the tradition has just been that when it's in Chatham kids get to Chatham got it um, to help Brendan numbers get more finalized can you um, Peter give us more of an idea of what the transportation costs will be how many practices and if there are um, some extra funds that are not allocated toward wrestling I'm going to ask that we keep that in the athletic budget and perhaps you know, I'm thinking here about paddle. If we're talking about 10 kids doing wrestling and 60-plus kids doing paddling, paddle, perhaps we could allocate funds if they are available. Yes. Thank you. Excellent. Any other questions on personnel? No. Excellent. Uh, Peter, would you mind? Sure. Agenda items A1 through 16 and addendum for A4, a 10, 17, 18, and 19. Ms. Chambers? Yes. Ms. Ciccarelli? Yes. Ms. Clark? Yes. Ms. Kenny? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Valenti? Yes. And Ms. Weber? Yes. Agenda items passed 7 0. Um, Mr. Ryan, are you able to move finance? Uh, you're on finance and facilities, yes. correct? Would you mind moving finance and facilities? Yep. Second. Uh, like to move agenda items B1 through B7 on the regular agenda? I just want to say thank you to the Eckerts for their donation of a plaque and a tree in dedication of um, 
his brother, class of 1967. Interesting. Not this, Darren, where that's going. Uh, is any questions for Peter or Dr. LaSusa or anybody from the Finance Committee on finance and facilities? Somebody second that, right, Peter? Yeah, Sorry, yeah. I was looking at the tree. Um, excellent, thank you. Peter, would you mind taking a vote? Yeah, I'm Seven. Ms. Chambers, yes. Ms. Ciccarelli, yes. Ms. Clark, yes. Ms. Kenny, yes. Mr. Orion. Uh, I will abstain on D7 and yes to one through six. Duly noted. Mr. Valenti yes. and Ms. Weber. Yes. Agenda yes. items B1 through B6 pass 7-0. B7 passes 6-0-1. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Moving on to curriculum, Mrs. Ciccarelli. Uh, yeah, I'd like to move agenda items C1 to C3 on the regular agenda. Excellent. Well, any questions on C3, since we can't talk about one or two? Uh, seeing none, Peter? Oh, sorry. I second. Oh, sorry. There you go. Off you go. All right. Uh, agenda item C1 to C3, Ms. Chambers? Yes. Ms. Ciccarelli? Yes. Ms. Clark? Yes. Ms. Kenny? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Valenti? Yes. And Ms. Weber? Yes. Agenda items pass 7-0. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we now have our opportunity for board business, and then following that will be public commentary. Um, Dr. LaSusa, we have no executive session tonight, correct? Excellent, thank you. Um, I do not have anything for board business other than to just reiterate the importance of communication out to the students that are no, essentially not going to graduate unless something changes. So um, I don't know if anybody else has anything from the board that they want to bring up, old or new business. Oh, oh, Ms. Chambers, excellent, good news. We love good news. We need we need some good news tonight. Good news, Mary Chambers. Here Excellent. we go. Take us take um, us home. I just want to share with everybody um, this September's issue of Morris and Essex magazine. Uh, we got a tremendous shout out uh, from this magazine for um, our the five hot sports. Move over football, basketball, and baseball. High school athletes are scoring points in the fast-growing alternatives. Um, our, our athletic director, Dr. Le, Dr. Labrera, is quoted in the first paragraph saying that students are finding, are, are, are moving away from um, the high-impact sports and finding other sports and other avenues, um, which is increasing participation. Um, and in, within the article, our fencing coach is quoted we have a tremendous fencing team. I, I, w I was uh, helped a, my neighbor kind of pick my brain a little bit on how to start that here, which I was thrilled to do. Um, they talk about our girls' ice hockey team, one of the fastest growing sports in the state and in the country, really. Um, believe it or not, uh, we at this point in time, we're sharing that with Madison. Um, but that has created a, a, a league in the state of New Jersey, which is getting a lot of support statewide. And uh, Kevin Hannon is our um, big proponent of that and our um, volunteer coach. So I hope we can, can, can support them and the paddle team and the sailing team. Um, the other one we have is, believe it or not, we have a boys volleyball team. I had, I, this was new, I just read about. We're, we got a shout out there. Of course, we got a shout out for our paddle team being the first one in the country. Um, and may I just add that the number one youth player plays for our team, rated in the country. The number one junior paddle tennis player in the United States plays for Chatham High School varsity team. So shout out to that. And the, the numbers on that seem to be impressive too. And I hope that, like Michelle said, we can look to fund those. Our sailing team as well was shouted out. I'm glad that we're able to continue that because that's that like paddle is a co-ed sport. So we're thrilled that we can have boys and girls competing together. And um, so I just want to say that we got a great shout out in this magazine and I'm so proud of the kids and the parent volunteers and the coaches who uh, dedicate their time to help these children uh, participate and find a place and represent their school uh, in just doing great things and being successful because we are pretty successful at all those options and they're not the traditional sports and I encourage the board to keep looking at these things and finding creative ways to, to pull some funding for them because I think they would appreciate anything we could give them because we are getting not only recognized in the state but we're getting recognized nationally as well so cheers to cheers to you guys Thank you, Mary I want every board member to bring a good news story. 
Every meeting, I want a good news story. Everybody else, bring a good news story. There's a tremendous amount of good things going on. The board meetings seem to get a little heavy, and we, we, we cover topics, but there's th literally thousands of great things going on in the district, and I think we need to start highlighting some of those and not, you know, no offense, Karen, but, you know, park's a little heavy and, you know, changing the calendar, redistricting. Nobody wants to hear any of those things, but um, we have an eighth grader, too, that competed in Ninja Warrior yes. Junior, correct, Sawyer? Kelly's, um, Kelly Lufborough's son. Yeah, seventh grader. Okay, and it, yeah. So he's competing on you know on television. It just aired um, Sunday night, I think, or IT voted Sunday night. So there's a tremendous amount of good stuff going on. Any additional uh, board business, Mike? You're good and good. Everybody's good. Okay, everybody, bring a good news story next next meeting. Um, okay, sorry for the lateness of the hour. We have our second opportunity for public commentary. Going once, going twice. Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody. Sorry for the lateness of the hour. Thank you for coming. Safe travels, please. I make a motion to close the public session.